Uh, good evening, everybody. I am calling back to order the uh, monthly meeting of the Township of Morris Township Committee for August 18th, 2021. We had our closed session at 5 p.m. and now this is our regular meeting public session at 7 p.m. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Mr. Jerfee? Here. Mr. Ravitz? Here. Mr. Mancuso? Here. Mrs. Wilson? Here. Mayor Grizel? Here. A both adequate and electronic notice of this meeting as required by the Open Public Meeting Act has been satisfied and a statement certifying same will be executed. Uh, before we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, we have, we're gonna have a moment of silence after the Pledge of Allegiance for uh, two local uh, gentlemen who passed recently. Uh, one is Bill Pendergrass, who is a 52 year volunteer uh, at our fire department. And uh, Mark and I were just at his wake, uh, Tim was earlier. And the second is uh, Sam Champy. I'm gonna let Tim Quinn do an introduction uh, to Bill Pendergrass and give a little bit of his background. Uh, Bill Pendergrass is from a longtime uh, Morris Township family. Um, actually, his uh, family were the founding members of the Woodland Fire Company, and he and his brothers did many years of service. Uh, Bill also served in the United States uh, Navy after graduating uh, Bailey Auto High School, and after returning from the Navy in 1964, um, he joined the Morris Township Police Department and admirably served uh, there for 26 years, um, retiring in 1991. And then he worked for Atlantic Health for a number of years after that. But Bill has been a long time uh, member of the Marsh Township Fire Department. He was also a founding member of the Marsh Township Office of Emergency Management, um, you know, lifetime resident of Marsh Township along with his family members. Um, significantly, you know, as they say in the days when you know, with the police world, you know, he was a cop's cop. You know, he was always there to back everybody up. He was always there uh, when things were, were tough. Bill was always there, the first one through a door or the, the guy that you wanted behind you if you went into a difficult situation. So um, long time missed, you know, had a lot of good conversations with Bill over the years. And uh, as I said, long time Morris Township president. And certainly it's, uh, his passing is a loss to the community. Very good. And when I just spoke with his brother at the wake, uh, they said they have a picture of the original Woodland Firehouse, which was in a barn mm -hmm. on South Street. Um, he's going to try to pass that along to us to post on our website. So um, we'll, uh, the, uh, the second uh, moment of silence we'll have is uh, for, uh, for Sam Champy, as I said, uh, the Morris Township and Morristown communities recently lost a baseball icon. Uh, Sam Champy passed away at the age of 76 a couple weeks ago. Coach Champy coached the Fairchild Fire Company team in the Marstown National Little League for four decades. He made an impression on numerous boys in our community, including my own son, who got to play for him uh, for three years. And I did bring in um, to show everybody the, the old uh, Fairchild Fire Company uniform. Uh, proud, to, proud, to, proud to be a Fairchild boy. Uh, my son, we're proud to be part of the Fairchild Nation, as they say. Uh, Coach Champy managed many all-star teams through the years, and he led two of those teams to a pair of state championships in the 1980s. Um, in addition, I, I coached baseball myself for seven years, and I can say that Sam Champy was one of those managers that other managers looked up to. They looked to him for how he guided his teams and how he treated his boys, um, and he was a, a, an inspiration not only for the kids in this town, but I think he was an inspiration for a lot of adults in our town, too. Um, I am so blessed to have known him and have him be a part of um, our lives and our family uh, for what he's done. So I know that there are a lot of little, little leaguers out there in the <laughs> audience tonight, and I ask that all of you boys uh, stand, and if you're wearing your caps, to take off your caps to honor uh, Coach Champy as we say our Pledge of Allegiance, uh, which, I, as I said, will be followed by a moment of silence afterwards. Thank you. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America. Of America. And to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody.
Uh, before we start the meeting, uh, I feel compelled to uh, say a couple additional words. Uh, we really needed two more moments of silence tonight, and I'd like to tell you why. Uh, when I first became mayor two years ago, one thing that I used this microphone for on this day was to speak out against gun violence. Um, there are two recently, uh, two tragedies in our country that I want to make sure everybody knows about because unfortunately there is literally so much gun violence in our country that it hardly gets uh, top billing on the news anymore. Uh, last week in Albuquerque, New Mexico, one student was killed and another was taken into custody after a shooting at a middle school near downtown Albuquerque during the lunch hour. And I repeat that, at a middle school. Uh, the, police, uh, the police commander described the uh, shooting as an isolated incident between two students uh, who were believed to be about 13 years old. Uh, but thankfully, there was a school resource officer present who ran towards the two boys after the gunfire erupted um, and prevented uh, any other violence. So thank goodness that school had a school resource officer at the time. Uh, there was also gun violence tragedy in Chicago about 10 days ago. Uh, officer Ella French, who was 29 years old and just got back from maternity leave, uh, she was ambushed and gunned down during a traffic stop, and she left behind her two-month-old baby. The gun used in this shooting um, and the murder of Officer Ella French was illegally possessed. And while we have strong gun laws here in the state of New Jersey, uh, it is my belief that our country needs stronger gun laws at the federal level to prevent further tragedies uh, like this. And I ask that you keep these two families uh, in your thoughts and prayers um, as they recover from these uh, personal tragedies. Um, and in addition to this, uh, in a related point, I, I do want to point out that there has been a lot of talk nationally about the role of policing and police officers in our community, in our country. And this incident in Chicago is just one example of how police officers all around our country put themselves in harm's way every single day when they show up to work. And I remind you that they do this to protect all of our communities. Um, Officer French was shot while she was making a traffic stop. And you would think that that's very simple to do. Uh, but that always means approaching a vehicle, not knowing who uh, is inside the car or what's inside the car. And so it's uh, not as simple as it might seem. Uh, so acknowledging these risks uh, needs to be part of the discourse when we talk about discussions about the role of policing uh, in our communities and in our country. And we must never forget the prosperity of our, our communities and our entire country uh, is due to the brave exertions and, and the service of our soldiers and our law enforcement officers. Um, so I apologize for going on uh, about these matters, but I really did want to uh, start the meeting off for recognizing uh, what's gone on in our, our communities and around our country. Um, and so thank you for indulging me with that. Um, we will turn to some more uplifting matters right now. Uh, the first is uh, two presentations. One is a proclamation uh, to Nick Fink in honor of his participation in the 2021 Olympics for Team USA in uh, Tokyo. And are the Finks with us tonight? Yes, they are. Yes. And have you brought them forward? Nick Fink and Peter Fink. And while you do that, I'm just going to hold up to the camera. Let's see. There we go. A little higher. You can see this. Do you want me to speak about it? Uh, sure. I am going to turn it over to uh, Deputy Mayor Jorpy uh, to talk about Nick Fink and his accomplishments. Thank you, Mayor, and um, I'm happy about our theme for not only this proclamation, but our next presentation. Um, it's um, one of the, it's, it's a nice thing to have for a community like ours, where we have so many uh, young athletes who grow up, play on our ball fields, um, play for our, our teams, go to our pools, and, and seeing a, a true example of how dedication and perseverance can lead to um, some tremendous outcomes. So, um, Tonight, uh, I'm proud to recognize a hometown Olympian, Nick Fink, who placed in the top five of his competition this summer at the Tokyo Olympics. Nick grew up in, Cromwell, in the Cromwell Heights section of Morris Township and is joined tonight by his parents, Danielle and Peter, as well as other members of the family. We are recognizing Nick tonight for not only his accomplishments in swimming, but also for the example he sets for countless young athletes growing up here in the township. Nick is an NCAA All-American swimmer, has competed in the world championships multiple times and is an international swimming league champion. Nick showed determination and perseverance over the past year, coming off of a wrist injury in the fall and recovering in time to compete this summer in the 200 meter breaststroke at the Olympics and placing fifth. I think one of the most impressive feats in Nick's swimming career is the fact that he was a relative latecomer to the sport, having gotten more involved on, uh, in swim teams following his sister's lead by joining Cromwell Pool. 
In addition to swimming for the Cromwell pool team, Nick also swam locally for Morris Center YMCA, the Lakeland Hills Y, and the Cougar Aquatic Club. At his final meet of champions in high school, Nick bro broke the New Jersey state record for the 100-yard brushstroke and anchored the record-setting 200 and 400 relays. After swimming for Pingree, he became an All-American swimmer at the University of Georgia, where he studied electrical engineering. During his senior year, he finished second in the nation in the 100-meter breaststroke, and he currently swims in the International Swimming Leagues uh, in the International Swimming League for the Cali Condors and plans to pursue a master's degree in the future. Nick Mars Hatchup is incredibly pr proud of your accomplishments and is delighted that your story is one that our current little leaguers and young athletes can aspire towards. They can become an Olympians if they put their minds to it, just like you did. Again, we congratulate you on what you have accomplished thus far. We wish you the very best in your future endeavors, and we welcome you to say a few words tonight, if you wish. Uh, sure. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's been a really crazy summer and, uh, you know, I want to thank you guys so much for, for, uh, acknowledging, uh, acknowledging, you know, this summer and, and, um, yeah, you know, just a message to all the younger kids out in Morristown is, you know, I, I ran those, those fields around, uh, Whippany Park and all those, you know, public, pu public places to train. And I swam in a bunch of those Morristown, Morse County pools. And, um, you know, it's, anyone can, can accomplish their dreams if they put their minds to it. And, you know, I'm so happy to have the community, you know, uh, around me and supporting me throughout, you know, this whole time, not just, not just, you know, in this year's, but in, in previous years when, you know, I've had highs and lows in my swimming career. So, um, you know, this means so much to me. It means so much to my family and, and I'm really, really proud to represent New Jersey and uh, Morristown and Morse County. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much, sir. And your parents look very proud as well. I can see them. <laughs> I can see them beaming. Um, and Nick, they always says, are. <laughs> uh, very good. And as I said, I'll, I'll hold it up again. Um, we have a proclamation for you and your family. Um, we'll get that. We'll get that over to you uh, somehow. We'll figure that out. Um, but thanks again, and we look forward to uh, giving this to you. And, and thanks for being uh, a leader uh, for our kids in the community, somebody to look up to. And thanks for those encouraging words. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Enjoy Thank the rest you. of your summer. Very good. Uh, next, we have a uh, presentation to uh, the Morristown Area Little League uh, 11 and under state champions. I am going to turn this part over to Mr. Mancuso. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we had a wonderful experience. Um, 12 of the nicest kids in the world with great parents. They, the team was 11 and one. And uh, the good thing about it is having won the championship up in Sparta next year, the championship games up to through 12 years old will be on Ginty field in Morris township. So really exciting. So this is the, this is the Morris town American little league, which are comprised probably more of the Morris Township kids than uh, Morristown. But um, the flag has been flying at Ginty Field, I guess, since last week. And uh, we're just so proud of them. Let me give you a, a little quickie, quick uh, indication of the names of all of our young men. Kenneth Sharpson, Sharperson, Max Weber, Cameron Gabriel, Gabriel, Jacob Conway, Brian Brady, Trip Mancuso, Brian Goldberg, Colin McDonald, TJ Kernow, Luke Villardi, Michael Belzano, and Noah Fulmar. Those are the 12 young men on the team. The coaches were Dan Conway, Steve Brady, and Ralph Balzano. Uh, as you heard, one of those names was Mancusa, was my grandson, Tripp, who's an 11 year old and a pretty good baseball player, but all of these kids pitched in. They did a great job. Some of them didn't get a hit until the last game. And when they did, they were instrumental in us winning the championship. So we're just so proud of them. Uh, 
I believe we have certificates for them and there's going to be another uh, event down the road. And I think we might have a plaque or so for you all. So thank you, kids. Thank you for the joy you've given us and God bless you all. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, we're going to, we're going to bring the coaches on uh, to say a couple words about the boys. So we're going to bring you up as a panelist. Mr. Conway is the manager. Mr. Conway? Mr. Conway. I'm here. Uh, very good. We can hear you and we can see you. Great. Would you like to say a few words about your boys? Uh, okay. I wasn't prepared, but uh, yeah, to just kind of sum up the year, um, the kids all came together. Uh, they supported each other. They played hard, played well together. Um, you know, we definitely, we had a couple ups and downs. We lost one game in the sectionals, but that didn't bring them down. They, uh, they fought through it, came back from the loser's bracket, made it all the way to the finals and won against truly a, a perennial state competitor in Tom's River East. And to say that we're proud is, uh, is an understatement. Um, this team, you know, we were out there practicing every day uh, in between districts and sectionals. And they really put the effort in. And, and, and more importantly as well, the parents. Uh, we had uh, parents running around bringing dinners to the kids so that we could spend more time together, really continue to grow the bond of uh, being teammates. That really played a big difference in, you know, sticking together through hard times in, in some of those games. And, and we're, just, we're just really so proud of it. We're excited for the future. We're excited for this group of kids. There are uh, really a lot of good, good kids and uh, we're excited to, uh, to play. And thank you all so much for having this. It means a lot to us and the kids. And uh, we look to make you proud in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And we do have a certificate for each boy uh, whose name was called out. Uh, we'll get those over to uh, somebody for distribution. Um, I don't have a sample to show you uh, like I did for the other one. Hold on. Oh, we do. Give me one second. We have one for the coaches also. And we have certificates for the coaches as well. Yeah, there we go. Cameron Gabriel certificate. Okay, this is this is one for Cameron, but uh, I'll show it uh, everybody. There we go. It's centered, and we have a nice cer certificate for each boy. Uh, congratulations to everybody uh, for a job well done. Uh, I'd like to add that uh, one thing I always say at our meetings is that our community is a very special place for many reasons, and one of those reasons are the people that volunteer and give their time to others in the community. Um, special thank you to the coaches on this team. Uh, not just this team, I should say, but all the coaches who, who coached in Morristown American and Morristown National, um, they give their time uh, to, to make our community a better place uh, to give back and uh, to bring some joy to the boys who participate on those teams and the families as well. So thank, a special thank you to the coaches for all you do. Very good. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so we're going to turn now to our... our Back to our agenda, and we have our first public commentary yeah. section. Uh, we, didn't do, we didn't do approval of minutes. Ah, I've, I've been told we didn't do the approval of the prior minutes. So let's go back and do the approval of minutes for July 21st, uh, regular and closed. Will somebody move those? So moved. Yes. Circulated, sir. Seconded. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, very good. And before we turn to the public commentary section, I just want to remind everybody that right after this first round of public commentary, we are going to have a presentation by uh, Robert Flynn, who's the Regional External Affairs uh, Director for Jersey Central Power and Light, JCPNL, our power company, uh, who's going to talk about preparedness and infrastructure improvements. Um, so I encourage everybody to stick around for that. And there's going to be a Q&A after that as well. Um, but we're going to open it up now to public comments and questions. Uh, from any of the buddy in the public who has one at the moment. So please raise your hand by clicking the raise hand button, or if you're on the phone, was it star nine? Yes, uh, star six. Star six, if you're on the phone. Yeah. We see anybody? Marlene Memmer. Marlene Memmer. Marlene? Yes, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, your, your name and address for the record, please? Marlene Memmer, 63 Independence Way. I just wanted to, last month I had inquired about the listing of historic sites in the township, uh, the ordinance 2021. 
And I just want to thank Cassie Wilson, Mrs. Wilson for pointing out about the photo album on a lot of these historic sites. It was, I went to the website and I, uh, you know, checked out the uh, residences and the other, you know, historic sites that we have in town. It was very enjoyable, very interesting. And uh, I know that my husband and I, when we walked the, um, the township at various times in the past, I'm sure we came across a lot of these homes. Um, so I thank you, uh, Mrs. Wilson, for pointing it out to me. But um, I also went to the um, ordinance 2021 because I wanted to get a listing of the uh, current uh, uh, residences and other uh, buildings that are on the historic uh, listing. Uh, it was not attached to 2021, but uh, I know that there was an original ordinance on that, so I went back to uh, Ordinance 0821, and I did find a listing. So I want to thank you very much for the information. Thank you, Marlene, and thank you to our HPC for putting it all together. It's great resources. Great. And for anybody listening in, uh, what Marlene is referring to, if you go to our website and you click on government, and then you click on the Historic Preservation Committee link, uh, there is multiple photo albums uh, that they have uh, accumulated and put up on the website uh, for your viewing pleasure of a lot of historic structures throughout the municipality. Uh, so it's a, a great thing for everybody to take a few minutes and go uh, take a look at. So thanks, Marlene, for pointing that out. And we'll I just have one minute. other. Yeah, I just uh, have one other question. Sure. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I just have one other question about, about it. Are any of these the residents, uh, residences that are on this listing, do they have markers on them? Um, I believe there is a residence on uh, Canfield that was the old drafting company. And I believe there's a, a placard there about that. Are there any other residents? Businesses that might have placards also. I don't. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, they have to be on the register. Yeah. Oh, they have to be on a register. Yeah, you can look. You look at, right. You can look. Yeah, you can look up the, the homes on the website. We have them listed all the historic homes, and then you can right. go out and take a look for them yourself. Uh, okay. But there's no marker in front of each individual home. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else from the public who has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, seeing none, will somebody move that we close the public portion? So moved. So moved. Uh, thank you. Second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, very good. Uh, thank you. So now, as I stated before, we're going to turn it over to uh, Robert Flynn, who is from JCPNL who's going to give us a presentation on storm preparedness and infrastructure improvements. Good evening, everybody. Mayor, thank you. Um, thank you for the committee, too, for having me and all the residents we have here tonight. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Bob Flynn. Uh, I am actually a lifelong Morris Township resident and played on Ginty and all the other fields within the, all the other fields within the township throughout my whole life. And my nieces and nephews are actively carrying on that tradition. So it's good to hear and didn't think I'd be following a fellow Olympian and the uh, state champs, but congratulations to both of them. Um, so as the mayor said, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna go into a presentation that we usually reserve for uh, our elected officials that we hold at our distribution control center where we usually do tours. Uh, obviously with COVID, we've had to pause some of that. And um, actually with this Delta variant, we may be kind of holding off on that a little bit further, but I'm gonna go into, <clears throat> excuse me, some of our storm preparedness, some tips, some infrastructure improvements as the mayor mentioned, um, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to take some questions. So I'm gonna just pivot now to my screen. And if someone can just confirm that they can see it, just give me one second, I wanna share a video as well. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Got Perfect. It. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this quickly. Obviously the most important part of these meetings is answering questions, um, but I think it is worth noting a lot of the information we have in here as well, some of these infrastructure improvements that are pretty important. So again, Bob Flynn from Jersey Central Power and Light. I'm the regional external affairs representative for the township as well as about 33 other towns. 
Um, as you can see here, we have JCPNL, a strong uh, relationship with New Jersey. It's our home base with Jersey Central. We have two headquarters, one based in Marstown, which is technically in the township, if we're going statistically what's accurate, it's the township. Um, and our second headquarters is actually down in Homedale, New Jersey. So my territory is, if you can see my mouse here, I am in Booton. That's actually currently where I am in my line shop. And I have a small portion of Summit underneath that. So for Summit, I have Morristown, Morris Township, and Bernard's Township. But in total with JCPNL, we have 1.1 million customers in 13 counties. We have $7.6 billion in assets, and we have about 26,000 miles of transmission and distribution lines within the state. And as most of you know, we're part of First Energy. Uh, they have about 10 operating companies in five states, and they are one of the largest investor-owned electric distribution utilities within the United States. So obviously going into our territory, I just showed you the map of our districts. Uh, those names that you saw there weren't the actual cities, but where we have our line shops located to respond strategically to any outages that we have. Um, being in New Jersey, we like to say that we work in the beautiful part of the state. Uh, we have by far the most tree density out of all of the other electric distribution companies that you can see here from this graph. And I'll pull up the other three major utilities. So you have PSENG in the orange that runs up this kind of central corridor from the state Atlantic City Electric, which occupies the southern half, and then just up north in uh, Bergen County, as well as portions of Passaic, we have Orange and Rockland, which is primarily a New York-based electric distribution company. So enhancing our en energy infrastructure is something that we're constantly doing. We're having to meet the future load growth in our service area. Um, obviously, each town is growing. There's a need for electricity and there's a need for that electricity to be reliable. So something that is a proactive um, effort that we make is, you know, inspecting equipment, which I'll go into a little bit later, but um, it's something that is a constant work in progress that we need to meet the goals, meet the load goals of our customers, as well as the major businesses that are in our service territory. So recently, I'm sure prior to me taking over the township, uh, Carol Bianchi was actually a representative for I think about a year or so. And she had probably mentioned this when the program was still in its very beginning or maybe halfway through. The Reliability Plus program was actually a pretty significant investment we made into the infrastructure. It was about $97 million <clears throat> and occurred from the beginning of 2020 to uh, the beginning of 2021. So this was $97 million that we invested into our, <laughs> our substation reliability. That primarily was for flood mitigation efforts. Uh, a lot of you probably are familiar with Hurricane Irene. We had a very significant flooding issue in a lot of our substations where the water rose to a level we have not really seen before. Um, at that point, I'd worked for Congressman Freelingheisen and had uh, toured actually a lot of the towns in Morris County to witness that damage firsthand. So we did have that in Morristown substation. It's just one of the many that have benefited from this substation reliability flood mitigation effort we have that's part of the Reliability Plus program. Um, also just a note, you may hear it referred to by us if you speak to different reps as IIP, which is the Infrastructure Improvement Project. Um, it goes by both names though. And then another feature we have is the distribution automation, which is uh, something, again, you probably heard from Carol, but these devices that are called trip savers, they are a fantastic new piece of equipment that's being installed throughout First Energy and also along the Eastern Seaboard, primarily from states and uh, operating companies that are affected from wind damage that are heavily vegetated. They are a device that I'll go in a little bit later where you'll be able to see a fuse. It's a pretty common piece of equipment you can see on the street. But this uh, trip saver is a device that actually automatically recloses itself where if you have a momentary fault, it will restore that fault. So what could be the normal process would be, you know, we'd have the resident call in the group of residents if they're affected by an outage, we would gather that information. We would dispatch what's called a troubleshooter which is they are, are usually our most advanced linemen that we have within our service territory in our districts. They are people that can kind of operate independently rather than a crew. They can go out and inspect and restore 
um, without having that crew there. So that, that would usually be the first step where we'd inspect it. We would see if there was any issues, any repairs that needed to be uh, repaired or equipment to be replaced, a fault that needed to be cleared. And essentially we would go back up with what's called a hot stick and throw that fuse back into the cutout, which holds the fuse and restore those customers. This device is an automated fuse. So before I go to a video, it's a quick minute video I wanted to show you from our website regarding the trip saver so you can actually see what it is. Uh, we've also done some underground maintenance in regards to our customers who are served underground via pad mounts and underground primary. So I'm gonna just pivot here to a video. And again, this is brief, but if, uh, if there's any issues hearing this, just let me know. Work is underway to install about 1700 trip saver units in our JCPNL service area by the end of next year. This work is part of the company's $97 million JCPNL Reliability Plus plan, which has a special focus on reducing extended outages during severe weather events. For outages caused by trees or animal contacts, trip savers allow us to automatically restore service to our customers rather than sending a crew to investigate. The electrical device works like a circuit breaker in your home with added benefit of automatically re-energizing a power line within seconds to keep electricity safely flowing to customers. Deploying this new automated technology reinforces our commitment to building a stronger, smarter grid that our customers can depend on in any types of weather conditions. Work is underway. Okay. Pivot it back here. Uh, just let me fix through these one sec here. So that's just a visual uh, video we have regarding our trip savers. Um, I think it's neat. I oftentimes find myself working for the electric utility constantly looking up when I'm walking and I notice these trip savers all over our service territory. Um, it's their first year within service. So we're still analyzing the data of it, but just from speaking from some of the other electric distribution companies along the Eastern seaboard, these have a, uh, a great benefit to customers that experience momentary outages that are due to, as uh, that foreman said, either animal contact or tree limb contact. Um, and again, another point to note, we have placed those on circuits that have a uh, decreased performing factor. So if there's a reason that a circuit goes out and we can attribute that to one of those reasons, those are the circuits that we're placing these on. Uh, two other benefits that come from the Reliability Plus program are loop recloser schematics, which are at our substations. Uh, a lot of times, if you get our outage notifications, you'll see that we'll say customers were restored via switching. This is something that happens at the substation through a smart piece of technology or at a safety device that's installed with on a pole called oftentimes a recloser. We have the ability to, in you know, fair weather, restore customers by actually putting them on a different circuit while we make repairs to the damaged one. And then the last thing to mention regarding this program is we've increased our strength of our distribution poles from a class four to a class two. So it's just a stronger, thicker pole. Um, obviously can't prevent against a 20,000 pound tree falling down and breaking poles, but it does a better job against carpool accidents and things of those sorts. Um, and another thing too is the, um, what's called like the actual cross arms on a pole. We're replacing those a lot with uh, metal cross arms to you know, remove any possibility of decay or termites or things like that that could potentially damage that, which would result in an outage. Vegetation management, um, it's one of the biggest things that we do for being an electric distribution company. Vegetation management is about, I would say 40% of this. Uh, we do proactive vegetation management. Reliability Plus was actually included in additional vegetation management where we went outside of our right of way and spoke to customers that had uh, tree issues that we'd identified by our foresters proactively traveling through towns. If we saw a tree that was dead, we would go to the homeowners, seek their approval to remove the tree and sort of work out an agreement whether we left the wood if they preferred that or if we took it away. Um, you know, we went through that pretty quick. Um, not every tree is within a three-phase spacer cable, uh, which is mainly those primary feeds that go through towns. I'll go through that a little bit later, but we removed trees that were out of that zone as well that were not that were different from our four-year clearance. So those lines are maintained within a 13-county service area. Um, they're given municipalities by BPU order are given two months notice of our vegetation management, and they are usually on a four-year trim cycle. Uh, and there's proactive hazard tree and limb overhang removal. 
Um, Tim, someone I speak to quite frequently regarding trees that we have that are potential issues that residents have brought to the township's concern. We will often go out and work with the township to you know, remove any potential hazard for our lines. Um, aerial patrols are also something we do. Those are mainly primarily for transmission uh, and the transmission right of ways, but they will fly rather low to inspect the equipment. And then for the last four years, we've done ash tree mitigation. Um, and more recently, we've done spotted lantern fly training for our crews to check their vehicles to make sure that if they're responding to different sections of New Jersey, that they're not transporting these, uh, these bugs that are causing quite a havoc right now. Some of the other preventative maintenance programs that we do are circuit inspections. They're done on a five-year cyclical basis. <laughs> Equipment deficiencies are identified and repaired proactively. And the wooden pole inspections are done by our third party company, Osmos. Uh, they work with pretty much, I think, every electric and utility company that owns any poles within New Jersey. They're primarily the ones that we use. And those are done in a 10 year cycle and they're repaired, reinforced as necessary. And then something that's really neat is this infrared scan, which is thermography. They take a thermographic camera and they point it towards equipment to identify any hot spots. So if we have a fuse that has, let's say, a crack in it or a primary line that got struck by lightning and there's pinholes in it, we have the ability to find that through this thermographic camera and make those repairs prior to it actually becoming an issue. Uh, fuses, as I mentioned with the trip savers, this is an example of a closed fuse on the left and an open fuse on the right. Not every open fuse means that there's no power going to a resident. A lot of times we have safety devices where we have to leave them open but they may allow us to isolate. If we have an issue further downstream, we could throw in that fuse on an open circuit if it's not in use and restore the customers back, you know, toward the substation or for the rest of the circuit. Um, but they operate pretty similar, similarly to the fuses and circuit breakers inside the homes. Um, another benefit we have, and for those that don't know, every electric distribution company is part of a regional mutual assistance group. Um, I believe this may have originated from the blackout that happened in New York City in the 70s. Um, I'm not 100% positive, but I believe that's where it was originated from. But the uh, benefit of being part of First Energy is not only are we part of the North Atlantic Mutual Assistance Group, we're also part of the Great Lakes since we have Ohio and West Virginia as part of our uh, operating companies with First Energy. So we have the ability to call on actually a number of different electric distribution companies if we anticipate a severe weather event. Um, you can see the list here, but this is something that a lot of times when we have a large scale event, yes, we have the benefit of calling in the First Energy sister companies if they're not affected. Um, and oftentimes being in New Jersey, we are often prone to a lot more, whether it's nor'easters or hurricanes or things like that, than some of the other operating companies within First Energy. So we can pull those crews, but in addition to them, we can pull these from uh, the Regional Mutual Assistance Group. So JCPNL follows the ICS, which is the Incident Command System. We speak proactively with our OEMs, our county OEMs, and we prioritize orders of importance for the county by municipality. Um, we go by state, by federal priorities. We include all of them in the process of restoration. This is something that kind of aligns all of the departments within Jersey Central and the rest of the operating companies within the state to have a standardized approach to hazard mitigation. Um, so it enables a coordinated response among various jurisdictions, as I mentioned, federal, state, public, private, and establishes a common process for all of those organizations that they know what their role is within an emergency. So the weather event process and some of the preparation that we take are we have company meteorologists with First Energy that issue emails to the entire operating companies and hold storm calls with our leadership to go over potential impacts into our service territory. Um, they map out timing, they map out percentages of potential for affecting customers or severe weather. Um, and we proactively kind of move assets around and staff in regards to what those predictions are. Same thing if you, know, if you see at the bottom extreme temperatures, we've had crews that have been on uh, consistently now for the past month and a half between the thunderstorms and the high heat that we've had, I think, every day it's felt like, at least for me, uh, over the past month or so. But we have uh, the ability to pre-stage locations um, for service restorations. We evaluate the need to call in our sister companies, additional staffing preparation 
Um, that hurricane that now, I don't know if any of you have seen, potentially has a further track westward, primarily seems like a more coastal concern in regards to surf. But again, that's something we're monitoring now. I've already received an email on it. There could potentially, if that thing tracks further west, be a process that we would implement the ICS process and start to call in for assistance if we predict that it could be a big event. Um, and then we communicate with our employees, our emergency management officials, our local and elected officials, and regards to our preparation efforts for a large scale weather event. Um, this is arguably probably, if not the most important, the second most important slide in this whole deck. And this is our restoration process for those residents that we have on the phone. Uh, just want to take a few minutes to go over what our actual process is regarding the restoration of our customers during a large scale weather event. So the first thing that we do is we call it life and limb emergencies. And these are emergencies where we have potential life-changing potential, uh, if, or excuse me, a potentially life-changing event that could be happening with our first responders, with residents. Um, those are our utmost priority and what we distribute our crews to first. Um, you know, that is top priority. It, it takes precedent over everything that we do is making sure that our workers, our residents, and our you know first responders are safe. So that is the first step in the, the restoration process. The second, which is largely what we had during East Aeus, is we had a lot of uh, transmission damage from trees that fell outside of the right of way that we, we maintain into our transmission lines that feed our substations. Those are essentially the heart. Those are the those are those are the pathway to the heart. The heart is the substation. We need to get those operational and those online before we can energize that substation and energize our customers. So that is the second priority after our life and limb. From there, we pivot to our critical facilities. These are hospitals, these are nursing homes, pump stations, uh, communication towers, things that are vital to our emergency responders that are operating inside this actual weather event. And from here, this is where we restore, restore our actual main amount of our, our customers and our distribution lines. This is really where the big restoration comes in for the highest customer count. This and number five, um, we repair these after we get the substation energized and we, you know, we're, we're viewing the totals of the substation to say, okay, we've received, we've got load in this substation and we're ready to distribute it. We need to make sure before we energize it and close that breaker at the substation to bring that circuit back, that there's no more repairs that's gonna potentially danger our crews or the public. So we have to inspect those circuits fully to make sure that it's safe for restoration. And from here, once we get that all clear, that's when we start to restore our largest customer amounts. Um, a lot of times what we find and, <coughs> excuse me, something that will be something that, you know, will look a lot different over the next couple of years with the introductions of automated metering and things like that. We rely upon our customers to call in our outages right now so we can get accurate assessments of actually how many customers are impacted. And a lot of times there's called lateral lines where, you know, the main circuit may run along 202, but there's a lateral that runs down and feeds, you know, 50 customers on a street. A lot of times we may bring that back, but there may be a tree down on that street. So we're kind of re, I'm, just, I'm going off script a little bit. We're, we're reassessing our scripting to our customers to give them the option to report that they're still out of power if they get that call that we, we believe we've restored them uh, to kind of fine tune and create a new order if it needs be. And then from here, this is the longest, you know, for these customers is the single no lights we call them. These are customers that have either damage to the service line that feeds their house or, um, you know, something happened that pulled the meter off their house and they gotta have their electrician make the repairs before we can come out and restore it. These are uh, usually the long, they're usually the longest to get restored and uh, really at the end of the restoration process is these customers. And just to touch on restoration, another point I wanna mention and another update that we've done, we've recently enabled a uh, ETR team that is proactively looking at our big outages that when we go out and we have our hazard and damage uh, responders inspect the actual work that's needed on a damaged circuit, we have the, uh, the means now to kind of go in and look at that order and say, okay, you know, if, if this is just, we had a branch fall down and it took down, you know, one span of primary, this is going to take us with the rest of the priorities we have a day to complete. Instead of those customers getting what's called a global ETR, 
a global ETR is uh, we are required by the BPU when 24 hours when a storm leaves our service territory to issue a global ETR. And that's essentially our best estimate of when the final customer will be brought back in. And again, if you're a customer that's on a 1500 or a 3000 person outage and your restoration is as simple as a fuse being thrown back in, if you see that restoration of four days from now, you're going to be upset and you're going to, you know, call the mayor, call the elected officials and things like that. We kind of have reassessed that and we have, we're implementing now for, and again, it's, it's very much in its infancy. We still have to fine tune it, go through a major storm, but we're, we're starting to implement uh, some system and user ETRs where we've had foreman hazard or damage assessors go out and look at the amount of work that's required for a specific job to say, okay, that one span that fell, that's not going to take six days. We can get that back up by Tuesday, something along those lines. So that's something these customers are going to be seeing within their experience on our website. That's a pretty significant update. Because again, I know being you know an elected official or mayor, that's probably, I know for certain, my phone absolutely blew up the minute the global was issued. So that's something we recognize is something we need to improve upon. So we're, we're taking steps to do that. And again, it may not be perfect for the first big storm that we have, but it's a step in the right direction for our customers, for our elected officials and so on. So um, then from there, safety, again, as I mentioned with the life and limb emergencies, safety is a top priority. We only work as fast as the safe work practices allow. This is an extremely dangerous industry that um, a lot like cops and firemen and things like that, that they go through that if they have a bad day at work, it's a potentially life-changing event. And that's the same with our linemen. This is very dangerous work and requires time. Um, our hazard responders and our damage assessors, they identify they're one of the first ones out in the field. Uh, we have issues where we run into a potentially backfeed where we have customers who may not have properly hooked up a generator and that may backfeed a line and we could potentially danger a crew. There's a lot of things that they have to worry about in the field uh, that may not get seen, you know, looking out the window. So our forestry crews also work in tandem with them. Uh, those hazard and damage assessors, they evaluate if there's a huge tree down across the road. If we're, we're going to need forestry and we're going to need three new poles, they'll put that in the order. So that way the crew showing up won't be having to go back to the line shop to get equipment to get out there. So that's something we do as well. We bring in other tree contractors, just like we have the Regional Mutual Assistance Group. We work with a lot of New Jersey tree contractors as well that are line certified to work around our equipment. And then lastly, our employees are trained to fill these critical roles. Communicating with our customers is another large part of what we do, something that we're constantly trying to update. We have our customer contact center. Um, anyone who doesn't know our number, the easiest way is 888-LIGHTS with two S's. Uh, we increase our staffing for our call center when we have large weather events. Uh, we provide proactive information if we're going to take a forced outage for equipment repairs through IVR, so which is the interactive voice response to our customers. We'll also make those calls if we anticipate severe weather within a 24 to 48 hour window. And Twitter and Facebook, I'm, I don't know if any of you follow us, that has grown robustly since I have first started working with the company. They're constantly posting updates if we're doing ice and water. Uh, we put those locations, power restoration progress, and our uh, if we have shelter locations or if we work in tandem with the municipality for, let's say, cooling stations during hot weather days, we'll post that information on our website and Facebook and Twitter as well. Uh, these are some preparedness tips that we have. Again, as I mentioned, you can visit the 24-7 Power Center at the link in this page above or just go to firstenergycorp.com and you'll find it pretty quickly. Uh, it's a really good tool that you can use and hone in on your actual outage. Um, you log into your first energy account, get the latest updates, report your outage, and you can actually now get updates via text, <coughs> excuse me, by texting that stat for status to 54487. You can also report your outage by texting out to that number as well. Um, and then just some general tools when we have these large, we large scale weather events, it's always good to have flashlights, extra batteries, charge your phones and your electronic devices if we're anticipating any severe weather like a hurricane. Uh, battery powered radio is something good to have, bottled water, plenty of bottled water, cell phone water and car charger. Um, again, just as just a visual for the 24 seven outage map, you can actually get statistics uh, municipal wide as well to see how much of the municipality is affected. And then just some other information on there as well, like how much, how many miles of distribution circuits do we have? How many poles are in the township? There's a lot of neat information in that, uh, that my town and 24 seven power center page that I'd recommend our customers use. And that's something that 
I uh, don't have specifics to share on this phone call yet, but something that we will be looking to kind of update a little bit over the course of the next hopefully few months. Um, so we'll have some more updates on that coming up soon. Alerts and reminders, timely emails, texts and messages. Um, customers can opt in or out related to uh, power outage information. And as I said, they can text that out number at the bottom of 544487. Uh, this is another thing I wanna mention. I'm just gonna pause this real quick. For our first responders, um, we used to have one first energy safety trailer for our entire operating company. Sorry, this is gonna probably do that full time. Um, now we have our own JCPNL specific one for our first responders and it's live wire training. A lot of my uh, friends are actually firemen with the township full time. And they tell me that that training was one of the best they saw. I think it was last year or the year before it was the police and fire from Mars Township showed up at our substation in Marstown. Um, we actually have our own now and I'll be running those trainings with our crews over the next probably a number of years. I don't think we ever plan to stop it now that we have our own, but it's a great demonstration. Uh, we took a quick video of the actual, the first day we had it, where we tested some of the demonstrations uh, and the safety protocol for our first responders. My goal is being the rep for Mars County. I'm going to work with Jeff Paul to find a date and time that we could potentially get a lot of uh, our municipalities, hopefully all of them, hopefully above 30, at least to the uh, county OEM to do this live wire presentation for our police and fire emergency responders. So I'll just show you a quick example of what it looks like. But that's that's all I have. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and go back, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, Peter Van Cuso here, uh, Bob. Can I, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, over the last ten or eleven years, I've been mayor in Morris Township three times, and we had three major storms and northeasters coming up toward us, and I just can't tell you how wonderful it was to work with you guys during this crisis time. I mean, Tim and I worked every single day. We were on phone calls and we put things out on uh, Twitter and on Facebook. And I just can't tell you the great cooperation we got from you guys. I know we weren't all happy, but you know, that's the way the world is. But thank you so much and for your presentation too. It's a good job. Uh, thank you for your kind words. I Appreciate that. And that's, that's a, it's a very important part and why I have a job is to work with the 33 municipalities I have during these emergencies. Thank you, sir. So thank you. I'd just like to second that as well. It's good to see you, Bob. And you too. I, I was uh, mayor during, I believe you pronounce it, IUSIS. Uh, that was quite a challenging storm. And the global ETR thing was, uh, was a big issue during that. The transmission lines, big issue. And the, um, also, I remember getting a lot of uh, complaints about the callback thing, where the, the automated call would come to people saying your line is back, but in fact, it was not back. And then people had trouble letting JCPNL know that they were not, in fact, in. So I'm glad to know that you're addressing that and, and agree with uh, Peter. You guys are very helpful to, to work with, and we really appreciate all that you do. So thank you. Thank you. And I think I think the message I think the message we're hearing is if uh, you let Jeff Grizel stay mayor, there won't be any power outages going uh, forward. <laughs> <laughs> Knock on wood. We've we've got no more weeks. Yeah, yeah, maybe I just maybe I just maybe, just, yeah, maybe I just cursed myself. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, one thing I learned. Yeah, one thing I learned when I became mayor, um, or when I got on the township committee, I should say, many years ago. So I didn't realize that the reason why we tell people not to touch wires when they're down is because they are uncoded. They're, they're literally live wires. Um, and what you see going overhead, you know, as you see power lines down the street, those are uncoded live wires. And I was, my question for Rob is when you talked about uh, the thermal cameras and you're looking up at the circuits, if you have live wires, how how does that not interfere with the thermal cameras that you're using to look for the breaks in the in the circuits? So a lot of them actually the and I don't want to get too technical, but a lot of the cables that you'll see along main streets that feed big developments are are actually coated in plastic. They are um, and they're called spacer cables. So they have usually it's like a gray piece of plastic 
that separates them because essentially if they touch you you blow fuses you potentially have transformer issues so those are usually the ones that we will use that thermographic camera for there's another type of primary wiring called open primary which you may just see if you live on a street with let's say 25 people you'll see a cross arm you'll see what's called bells they actually look like bells that's what we refer to them as those mm -hmm. are open wire. So those won't really, those will be more visual inspections than they would be the thermography. Okay. Um, my other question for you is how much smarter is the grid getting? So you said during your presentation that JCPNL is getting better at, you know, when there's an outage redirecting uh, sections of town to other parts of the grid. So can you speak to how much smarter the grid is getting and what we can expect in the future? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, currently right now with, I believe it's still with the Board of Public Utilities, but we have a proposal in to convert our meters to automated metering, which is essentially the future of customers and their, and making smart, reliable energy choices within their home. So this is something that is pretty exciting for us because we'll have the ability, uh, and this is me speaking from an outage perspective, but Right now we rely upon our customers to call us. With an automated metering, the way it works is that essentially if we, if we get a report back from a customer's meter that we're having an issue, essentially what the next step would be is a troubleshooter would go out, or let's say we get a call from 25, that's probably an easier example. 25 customers have an issue, we're getting a report back from their meters that we're, you know, they don't have power to them, something has happened we can make repairs and start to read that information to more fine tune where we are making our efforts, what the issue was that's caused the outage. And what's really neat, if I understand it correctly, is we'll have the ability on these trucks with uh, our line crews have tough books. We'll have the ability to hit a ping, which will send out a message to the meters of the customers to determine if we have a more localized issue or if this is potentially widespread. So that's, some, that's something that's making it better. I will say, though, I, I am excited about that. I think, you know, in terms of reporting outages, we'll still have to do that, but it'll make us a lot more smarter and concentrate our efforts a little bit better to know exactly where we have issues when there is an outage. The other thing that we're doing is kind of, uh, we are hardening the grid right now. Obviously, load is becoming something that is constantly growing, and especially uh, where I currently live now is Marstown. There's a ton of new development. Um, we're actually building new circuits. We're installing equipment at the substations that um, you know may not have been updated for a number of years for these smart technologies that is a lot of it can be done remotely. So instead of having a substation crew go out and manually adjust things in the skin again, I'm not an engineer, so I apologize, but manually adjust things inside the substation, we could potentially do this from a remote location to get our customers back quicker. Wow. So there's those, there's those changes, you know, we're having to adapt to obviously a lot of customers with the EV charging stations. A lot of our municipalities are asking about that as well. So that's something First Energy and, um, you know, has implemented in a number of the opcos and hopefully coming to New Jersey pretty soon. But that's going to that's gonna change the, uh, the load that we have. So it's essentially we have to adapt and we have to, you know, make these circuits as reliable as possible and meet the future load that we'll have. Very good. Uh, Bob, I have a few questions. Thanks for the time. Um, sure. And I will say I'll echo uh, some of the statements made before. Um, I've been on doing a number of storms out on calls with JCPNL uh, employees during hurricanes and winter storms and nor'easters and all that. And um, we truly, especially, you know, being a first responder, we certainly appreciate all the hard work that they do during very difficult situations and dangerous conditions to restore power to our residents. So thank you for that. And thank you to JCPNL for that. I did have three quick questions. One, I know uh, in the past several years, um, Morristown continues to have issues in town um, with um, fires underground and manholes, particularly on Madison Avenue. And I know that this sometimes impacts Morris Township. I was wondering if um, you had any uh, update on improvements that are happening to try to uh, prevent issues in Morristown impacting residents across our town? Sure. So that first question, um, yeah, as you know, we had that issue, I believe it was last week. I just so happened to be running through town when that happened. So that was not fortuitous timing, but, um, you know, stayed on scene and 
spoke with our cable crews and we're actually doing a number of different things is we, we did have a fault on one of the circuits that um, we had a device issue inside the actual manhole that caused that. Um, so that's currently being replaced this week. Plus we are reconducting a lot of the circuits that run through Marstown. Um, that's something that we do, you know, I want to say almost annually, because again, we have a incredible load on what's called the network within Marstown. A lot of businesses run at the same time, and there's even more coming online with uh, M Station and some of the other developments that they're doing. So we have, um, we install what's called fault line indicators to reduce the number of outages and pinpoint if we have issues. And then uh, reconducting and replacement of a lot of transformers over the past year that I've, I've coordinated with the town. That's uh, one benefit of having Marstown is I get looped into a lot of that information. I know it does affect, uh, particularly there's one circuit that I know does affect uh, a number of township residents because it goes a, a, a length. Um, and that's something that actually the, the new circuit that I'd mentioned out of Collinsville, uh, we built that, it runs along Speedwell, is actually gonna benefit in addition to the Marstown residents, there's a number of Mars Township actually that get fed from this new circuit. Um, but in terms of the network, proactive maintenance, something we're, we're doing, we've always done, it's BPU required. We have to give reports. Um, we inspect the manholes, we inspect the equipment. And then, like I say, we, we take these proactive measures when we have these high heat days, you know, to reinforce it, essentially. We have a number of different circuits where we can switch customers, which is a benefit. But occasionally, like you mentioned, there are those issues that we have, whether it's a piece of equipment uh, or something like that, where we have to address it. So it is constantly ongoing in terms of the improvements. Thanks for that. Um, another question I had, um, and I know it's a growing concern and it has been a concern for a while, for, particularly for utility companies is uh, cybersecurity, ransomware, things like that. Um, what is First Energy doing uh, and JCPNL specifically to ensure that your grids uh, are not prone to any type of disruption due to um, outside actors? So I, I can't really give a ton of specifics. Um, I can probably email you something on it because they actually just posted an article on it. We had a, uh, obviously, as you know, the, this is the Columbia pipeline, right? Recently had that issue where they got hacked. Um, yep. Huge security issue uh, happened in California a number of years ago. It's something that's taken very seriously. We are, you know, we have transmission services that are operated in both New Jersey as well as in Ohio, and they are set to a strict guidelines. It's to the point where that even if I came to your council meeting, I can't show you, I can show you the name of a substation. I can't show you the circuit number. Um, so it trickles down not only from those operators, those transmission and distribution operators, it trickles down to my level, which deals with the public. Um, but again, I can see I, there's got to be something I can share with you in regards to what, because I, again, I, I, I read it, I saw it, I just, I haven't, I don't have it in front of me to get you right now. It's all good. Thank you for that. Um, and then just the last thing you mentioned, uh, the EV program. Um, the township would further encourage JCPNL to fill out a program to help uh, further encourage EV charging. Um, in Mars Township, we plan on installing two different charging stations, uh, municipal facilities, uh, and we are eager to hear more about the program from JCPNL coming out. Agreed. Yeah, I, I, if it's any consolation, I'm very much pushing for it for our government affairs guy as well. Um, it's in Maryland, it's in Ohio, and I think it may be in Pennsylvania too right now for us for the last state to get it. So I'm trying to push because I do have a number of municipalities that have reached out looking to partner. And it's a it's a it's a win win for both. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Uh, Bob, this is Bud Rabbits. Uh, Mark took both of my questions. I guess that's a good thing because we're <laughs> thinking alike. <laughs> uh, but I, I did want to say, in addition to, you know, what my colleagues have said on on uh, on here so far, you know, thank you for this really wonderful presentation. I especially like the emails and the text that I get regarding saying that, uh, you know, JCPNL is, uh, you know, standing by, you know, in, in, for an emergency, which actually sometimes precedes me like, wow, I, I didn't even know a storm was coming. So it makes me kind of look at the weather report. So. Uh, I really appreciate those those texts and emails. So thank you very much for JCPNL for, you know, really getting that information out there that you guys are ready. So good job. That's good to hear. Nice to, nice to meet you too. 
Sorry, I took your questions, bud. That's okay. You, you did great. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Anybody from the public? Oh, yes. We're going to open it up to the public. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, anybody from the public have a question for Rob or anything about JCP and L? Please raise your hand. We see anybody out there? No, sir. Nobody. All right. We don't see anybody. So uh, we'll thank you again, Bob, for uh, coming out and giving us that nice presentation. Uh, we'll see if we can put that up on our website. And. We'll just move on in the agenda then. Thank you very, Thank very you. much, everybody. Have a Thanks, great Bob. night. Thanks, Bob. Take care. Thanks. Uh, so next up, we have ordinances for public hearing and final consideration. Uh, once, no, oh, it's two-sided here. Very good. Uh, so we have ordinance 22-21. Uh, uh, Mr. Carlson, can you read that into the record? Thank you, Mayor. This is an ordinance amending chapter 95 zoning of the code of the township of Morris to add section 95-37.1 building design guidelines. Uh, this is an ordinance adding guidelines for residential and non-residential buildings. Uh, very good. There's a change that he has to. Uh, yes, and there is a change that you need to uh, uh, yeah. uh, Mr. Quinn, do you have that in front of you? Mm, I know it's gonna okay. move, we're gonna have move it. it. Um, um, sorry, this is Juno. Um, so it would be changing it to chapter 57 from 95. Um, it would be section 57-87.1 building design guidelines. Thanks so much, Danielle. We're just, it's just a matter of, uh, we're changing the codification, putting it in a different place in the ordinances. Correct. So not, nothing about the ordinance itself is changing. It's just going to a different place. Um, and that's deemed a minor change. So this is, a. Uh, hearing, a public hearing, and for final consideration, I, I will make a couple comments. Uh, I sit on the board of, uh, sorry, the planning board, along with uh, Kathy Wilson, and this was one of uh, my priorities coming in when I came in as mayor in 2019, and uh, we finally got to work on it this year, uh, and it applies uh, building standards to uh, construction in our town, to both residential and non-residential. Um, I can read you some of the section titles. Uh, it's called building massing. Uh, so uh, second is arcade walkways, things like that. First floor uh, retail height, if there's a retail uh, segment to a building, uh, vertical bays, horizontal step backs for the roof line uh, to make sure that the sort of architecture is uh, more appropriate. Uh, there's guidelines on roof shape. Uh, for townhouses, we have... Uh, Guidelines on front garages, articulation of garage doors, uh, disguising with active uses uh, with architectural screening, um, certain features on townhouses, uh, below building proposed parking has a uh, couple lines there, uh, standalone parking garages, gates on garages, architectural detailing, uh, ent uh, entryways for housing, housing, townhouses and entryways for uh, family residential, um, office, hotel, and retail, and mixed use buildings, um, facades. Uh, this is a section on windows. Um, for example, a minimum area for a facade, um, privacy for first floor uses, uh, window placement, um, talks about dormer windows, uh, window proportions uh, in regard to framing and dimensionability, uh, garage windows uh, as they relate to facades. Um, there's also a section on building materials uh, and variation of use of materials, uh, use of stone, brick, and other masonry, window glazing. Um, and there's a section on service and mechanical uh, areas so that they're appropriately screened. Um, then there's a section on amenity spaces, such as outdoor dining areas, uh, roof decks, uh, private balconies, and such. And there's a small section on office building renovations. So what we try to do is put some guidelines in place. Uh, then they are only guidelines. It, it, it gives some direction to uh, people who are want to build in our town to what the planning board is looking for in terms of standards, uh, quality of materials, quality of design, uh, creativity to design and such uh, that we think will be a big improvement to 
the types of buildings that you see in the future in our town. Uh, so with that said, will somebody move 2221? I'll we'll move, move that, Mayor. With the change. Uh, and somebody will move it with the, uh, can, and, uh, with the change. Wilson, can you move it with the change? Thank you. With the change, I don't have the numbers right uh, at my fingertips. Uh, it, it'll be chapter 57. I'm sorry. I'm going to say just move it with the changes as, as previously articulated. Okay, I move it with the changes as previously articulated. I second that. Uh, very good. So since this is a final hearing for adoption, uh, we are going to open it up to the public for any questions or comments uh, solely related to Ordinance 2221. So if you would like to make a comment or have a question, please raise your hand. I would like to make one comment, Mayor, since I don't sure. see one. Go ahead. Um, yes. this, this was a, a big project, long term, and it was a lot of effort by a lot of people. And I'm really glad to see us at this point. And I know it was a, a big project for you. And uh, so I'm sure you're it, it it's it's really good to see that we're that we're adding this to our code. So thank you to you and to everyone else who worked so hard on this. Yeah. Thank you, Committee Woman Wilson. Okay. Uh, good comment, uh, Kathy. I move we close the public portion, sir. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, very good. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Jerfee? Yes. Mr. Ravitz? Yes. Mr. Mancuso? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Mayor Grizel? Uh, yes. And I too would like to thank the planning board for all their hard work in, in bringing this to us. Uh, in particular, uh, Chairman Edward uh, Benoit, who did a lot of the work leading the subcommittee uh, to pull this all together. So thank you, Chairman Benoit. Uh, I, Jeffrey Grayzell, Mayor, declare the ordinance adopted and finally passed, approve the same, and direct that the clerk publish proper notice thereof in the newspaper and to record the ordinance in the proper place. Uh, Mr. Carlson, Ordinance 2321. Thank you, Mayor. This is an ordinance amending Chapter 9, Article 1, Section 9-3, Membership, Terms of Office to provide a one-year term of office for student members, set the age requirement for student members and require background checks for environmental commission members and require environmental commission members to sign and agree to a code of conduct. This is a... Good. It uh, speaks for itself. This amends the uh, membership terms and requirements of the Environmental Commission. Yes, very good. I was going to say it does speak for itself. We are adding student members to our Environmental Commission. I'm happy to have uh, kids participate and uh, uh, get some exposure to uh, civic duty, um, all for a good cause. Uh, so will somebody move 2321, please? I'll move it, Mayor. Second. Second. Very good. Uh, I will open up to public comments and questions. If anybody from the public would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. Move we close the public portion, Mr. Mayor. Second. Thanks. All in favor? Aye. All right. All right. Very good. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Mr. Jorofey? Yes. Mr. Ravitz? Yes. Mr. Mancuso? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Mayor Grizel? Uh, yes. I, Jeffrey Grizel, Mayor, I declare the ordinance adopted and finally passed, approve the same, and direct that the clerk publish proper notice thereof in the newspaper and to record the ordinance in the proper place. Uh, Mr. Carlson, Ordinance 24 21. Thank you. This is an ordinance repealing Chapter 165. Section 165-18 prohibited acts exceptions to be consistent with public law 2021 chapter 38 and amending chapter 367, section 367-3 alcoholic beverages and narcotics prohibited exception to prohibit cannabis, cannabis related products, tobacco smoking and vaping in public parks, playgrounds and other public places. This is an ordinance that uh, is up for consideration tonight to update the township code um, to reflect the uh, recent changes in state law regarding cannabis. Very good, thank you. And I'm gonna ask Mr. Quinn to just uh, speak to this uh, for a minute. Uh, he did last month, but we'll do it again. Very good, thank you, Mayor. 
Um, this deals with just so that we are compliant with the statute that deals with cannabis. And as part of that legislation that came through also deals with alcohol. Back in 2000, the state legislature, and then signed by the governor, authorized municipalities to enact ordinances and municipal code that prohibit the possession of alcohol on private property by persons under the legal age of, of 21. Um, police department, if they had like a student party or a high school party, they were able to go in, do that, um, conduct an investigation and then um, call in the parents. And um, most of the times they were adjudicated with what they called station house adjustment where the ch children and the parents would have to come in um, and the parents would see the pictures and those kinds of things of what was taking place at a private property and private, uh, somebody's private residence. Um, this legislation uh, no longer permits that. So to be compliant with the statute, um, we are rescinding that portion of the ordinance for possession of alcohol for that. Um, the second part of it were, is that um, right now it's prohibited to have um, alcohol and tobacco on our public uh, parks. And this will also then add in cannabis as a prohibited substance on our uh, park areas. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Uh, will somebody move 2421, please? So moved. Second. Very good. I'll open it up to the public now for questions and comments uh, solely related to Ordinance 2421. Please raise your hand if you would like to comment. Take a motion. We close the public portion, Mr. Mayor. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Mr. Jorphy? Yes. Mr. Ravitz? Yes. Mr. Mancusa? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Mayor Grazel? Yes. I, Jeffrey Grazel, Mayor, declared ordinance adopted and finally passed, approve the same, and direct that the clerk publish proper notice thereof in the newspaper and to record the ordinance in the proper place. Uh, so now we have tonight we have one ordinance for introduction. That's ordinance 2521, and I'll turn that over to Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Mayor. This is an ordinance. Amending Chapter 9 entitled Boards, Commissions, and Committees, adding a new article to be known as Article 10 entitled Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, this is an ordinance establishing a committee to make recommendations regarding the needs of senior citizens in Morris Township. Uh, very good. And this was an effort uh, made by Committee Woman Wilson to get this in place. Uh, Kathy, would you like to make a comment about it? Yeah, I would just like to say that I'm glad that we're putting this forward. This establishes a committee comprised of nine members to um, discuss and make recommendations to the township committee on ways to address um, the needs of senior citizens, including such things as transportation, housing, meals on wheels, et cetera. And um, so I'm very glad to see us do this. And um, it, we're, it's for introduction tonight. Very good. Uh, would you like to move the ordinance, Kathy? Yes, I definitely would. Thank no. you. I'd like to move uh, that we introduce this ordinance. I'll second that. Uh, thank you. So since this is just an introduction, there's no public hearing, and we'll just go to a roll call. Mr. Jerfee? Yes. Mr. Ravitz? Yes. Mr. Mancuso? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Mayor Grizel? Uh, yes. Uh, this ordinance will be read for a second time at our meeting on September 14th uh, at 7 p.m. for a public hearing. And I will say this for the first of several times tonight that our meeting next month is on Tuesday, September 14th, not the usual Wednesday because of the Jewish holidays. So Tuesday, September 14th is uh, the date of our September meeting. Uh, now uh, we have a good report from our administrator. I uh, will turn it over to Mr. Quinn. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just one bid report on this. This is our annual uh, general services contract uh, that we put out. This is a lot of these minor, smaller jobs that we put into one bid package and hire a contract to do them. And they include things as curbing, uh, sidewalk repair, drainage issues, um, these infrastructure improvements throughout the township. 
the bid specs went out in July. Uh, seven uh, sets of plans were picked up and bid specs were picked up. Um, we had the bid opening for this on August the 11th and six of those seven submitted uh, bids. The lowest bid was $594,452. The highest bid was $895,240. Uh, follow the bid opening. This was reviewed by our engineering and our purchasing uh, agent. They have determined that the lowest responsible bidder is SNL Contractors of Kenilworth, New Jersey. Uh, for your consideration tonight is a resolution awarding the contract in, in the amount of $594,452 to SNL contractors. And that will conclude the bid report. Very good, thank you. So we will move on to resolutions. Uh, we have resolutions 169-21 through 18321. And if my math is correct, that is 15 resolutions. Uh, are there any that we need to pull aside? Mr. Joker, do you have any? No. None tonight? We can, uh, and just for the record, we did not uh, have any resolutions coming out of closed session. Uh, so these are the 15 that are before us tonight. Uh, will somebody move resolutions 169 through 183? I'll so move. I'll, I'll take Second. that as a, very good. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, very good. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Mr. Jorky? Yes. Mr. Ravitz? Yes. Mr. Mancuso? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Mayor Grazo? Yes. Uh, now general business correspondence as circulated. Will somebody move that? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, very good. Uh, so now we have our standing committee reports and uh, which will be followed by commentary, but I do prefer to stick to standing committee reports first, uh, and then you can come back and say anything you like about uh, general commentary. Um, so I'll start tonight with uh, my colleague to the right, Mr. Jorphy. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, for my standing committee reports, um, I will be doing legislation and transportation standing committees for legislation. Um, Kathy, I know the senior advisory committee ordinance has been on your radar for a long time, and I was happy to work with you on its introduction. So congratulations to seeing this through and I'm looking forward to uh, supporting its passage uh, next month. Um, I'd also like to congratulate you, Mayor, um, Kathy, and the planning board on the construction ordinance that we passed tonight as well. Uh, it's gonna help promote a cohesiveness in future construction projects in the township. I think many of us agree that certain projects have left a lack of uniformity and character that, have, uh, that we have seen historically in the township and promoting better building materials uh, as well as design standards are a big step forward. Um, for the transportation uh, standing committee, um, the transportation advisory committee continues to work on our summer projects um, to uh, have, we're working on three items. One is the uh, traffic calming policy that we plan to um, take up in our, during our September meeting. Um, the, an, another project is working on bettering our transportation advisory committee website and providing useful information and helpful uh, links for residents to find all in one place. And the final one is the Lawanica Loop uh, project that will actually be kicking off this Saturday at 10 a.m. So I'll start off with the Lawanica Loop. Um, the Lawanica Loop, uh, which was uh, first proposed by one of our members, Jim Hunt, who's a member of the Free Wheelers Association uh, in Morris County, uh, is a well-marked trail with several sections of car-free travel for riders. Uh, over there's over five miles uh, on the loop uh, for family and friends to ride through parks around southeastern uh, the southeastern section of the township, uh, with connections to many other recreational facilities. The loop goes through Lawanica uh, Park. It goes by the Seaton Hacking Stables, Ginty Pool, and the recreational complex. It goes on the traction line. Uh, it goes by the Shakespeare Garden and Kitchell Pond. Um, this is a fun activity. It's a way for us to promote folks to get out of their cars and onto their bikes. Uh, to um, It's a great way to enjoy the final weeks of the summer and to see different parts of Mars Township that you may not have seen before. So kudos to our volunteers uh, who have worked on this over the past several weeks. Uh, thank you to our township professionals for helping us um, ha have this project come to life. And we invite the public to join us Saturday morning at 10 a.m. here at the municipal building uh, to kick off the loop. 
and feel free to come ride with us. Um, for the TAC website project, we'll just be consolidating a lot of different information, whether it has to deal with trails or uh, requests or uh, you know, service requests or um, providing commentary to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, we hope to continue working on that. And lastly, um, as I stated last month, uh, TAC is uh, working on drafting a traffic calming policy. And we've been working with our township engineer uh, and our township administrator on putting together a policy to recommend to the township committee, uh, hopefully at our September meeting. So uh, with that, I will yield back there. Uh, thank you. Uh, committee woman Wilson, I'll let you go next. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I'll be reporting on the um, environment and the uh, fire department. So on the environment standing committee, I'm really happy to see us um, introduce the, the student associate members ordinance. It'll be great to see kids joining uh, on, for some activities. And it's another indicator of our, how much our uh, EC is growing. Um, I wanted to highlight a project that one of our subcommittees is working on. It's a do not plant list. This subcommittee has done a lot of backward background work on this project. I think it's really interesting. Um, it provide, this list provides information on invasive plants that are not recommended and native plants that are recommended. Eventually, once this document is vetted by our professionals, a do not plant list can be a helpful resource for all of us. A particularly interesting and important use I see for this list is for applicants who come before our land use board. Before making their landscape plans, it would be helpful for them to have such a list to refer to. So this list has a ways to go before it gets to that point, but I think it's a very innovative project and I commend the efforts of this subcommittee to get it going. So this is on the to be continued list. Uh, on the fall festival, EC uh, is working to uh, make plans to participate. They were talking at their last meeting about um, have needing to, uh, they have more stuff to include than space available at the uh, location they'll be getting. So this is a, a good problem to have. And um, I just want to remind everyone, encourage everyone to attend. It's Sunday, October 3rd from 12 to 5. Uh, in the green. A quick comment about their newsletter. Uh, a few members of the EC are in the process of preparing the next newsletter, which will come out at the end of the month. Creating a newsletter takes a lot of time and effort. It's something that I've been wanting our EC to do for years and years. And now with the addition of some new associate members, I'm glad that we have people who are willing and able to work on this project. I commend their efforts and I'm glad we're working on ways to interface the efforts of our volunteers and our staff members. Their subscription list continues to grow. As always, I encourage everyone to sign up for the EC newsletter, go to the Township's homepage, click on government, click on environmental commission and you'll see the subscribe um, button at the bottom. I see a couple of people from our EC on, on uh, attending tonight. I wanted to say that uh, our green team resolution was um, uh, supposed to be on tonight. Uh, we had a little bit of a miscommunication, which I will take credit for <laughs> my fault. So I'm sorry about that. And um, we will uh, uh, have the green team resolution on the agenda for our September meeting. Um, as far as our fire department, I did want to um, uh, comment on Bill Prendergrass's passing. He did, as we said in the beginning, I'm glad we had a moment of silence for him. He served in our police department as well as our fire department. Longtime member, um, joined uh, Woodland, I think, in, I read, in 1969. So his service to our community has really been greatly appreciated and um, condolences to his family and friends. I also wanted to mention that we have, we are adding three new volunteer firefighters to our roles, all joining both sides. Brian Watson, Leonard 
and Tico and Dmitro Shanko, hope I pronounced those correctly. All of these uh, men have completed the full application process, which includes many hours of training. Completing the process is, it's, is an accomplishment in itself. And I wanna thank all of these uh, guys in advance for your service to our fire department and to our community and congratulations and welcome aboard. So that is it for me, Mayor, back to you. All right, very good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ravitz, I'll let you go next. Okay, um, I'll report on infrastructure. That was an easy one because there's nothing much of substance to report until uh, after next month's and by next month, I mean uh, September's meeting. So uh, stay tuned for a more detailed report on that. Regarding uh, parks and rec, uh, due to the ongoing impacts of the COVID pandemic on, our, on the fall 21 and the winter 22 programming, we're only publishing electronic versions of the program, uh, the service brochures and limit, eliminating the printed hard copy uh, mailed versions. The brochure was part, uh, posted on the Parks and Rep uh, Department webpage earlier this week and announced also on the, on the web um, Facebook page. Uh, once we know more about the availability of public school buildings for the winter programs, we'll, be, uh, again, we'll begin preparations for um, a separate winter 2022 brochure. Uh, there will be a, a, a ribbon cutting ceremony on our newly built pickleball courts uh, located at uh, Ginty Park on September 11th at 9 a.m. Tim, is that correct? 9 a.m. on the 11th? Yes, sir, that is correct. For, uh, for those who are aware, aren't aware, pickleball is one of the fastest growing uh, court games uh, in America. Uh, lastly, uh, some of our parks are in need of restoration uh, to meet the needs of our growing community now and for the foreseeable future we're exploring having a park master plan developed by a specialist and more on that as it uh, begins to develop. So uh, that's it for me and back to you, Mayor. Uh, very good. I'm gonna add uh, September 11th, uh, 9 a.m. to my calendar as well. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mancuso. Thank you very much, sir. Just quickly, um, appreciate the fact that the, that the brochure will be online and be sure that people realize that it is there. Um, pools after obviously a uh, uh, little difficulty in the beginning as far as uh, how many people wanted to join. We have gotten everything under control there and it seems to be working uh, perfectly well. And I'm just delighted at the senior citizens uh, uh, advisory committee I would say by in 20 years, when we're all senior citizens, we will have an opportunity to be part of it. I'll save my, the rest of my comments for later, sir. Very good. I'm glad you look at yourself as being such a young man, Mr. Benkisa. I a two for one, I'd still make it. Yeah, very good. Um, for me, I have three uh, reports tonight. Uh, first is police. I want the community to know about the meritorious service of Sergeant Clay Boninghouse. Uh, in, in resolving a case involving an abandoned boy. Uh, last, more, uh, last month, Sergeant Boninghouse was on patrol and he spotted a 14-year-old boy riding his bicycle in Morris Township. Uh, sergeant followed the boy who ran into a nearby home and the sergeant was concerned and he spoke then with a neighbor that believed that the boy was living nearby without a guardian. Uh, through his follow-up investigation, Sergeant Boninghouse determined that the boy came from Honduras two years ago with his father, who had ultimately left the country after placing his son in the care of a family member. But that family member had reportedly uh, stopped providing care for the boy and he was now living on his own and taking care of himself. Uh, so the boy was brought to Morristown Medical Center for a health assessment and then placed in the care of the Division of Child Protection uh, and Permanency. And a uh, quote from uh, Police Chief DeCarlo stated, uh, Sergeant Boninghouse exemplifies the professionalism and devotion to the welfare of others that our agency strives for on a daily basis as a whole, and we, uh, we are to commend him for his actions uh, that evening while recognizing that this is just one example of the exceptional service he provides on a daily basis to the residents of Morris Township. Uh, so thank you, Sergeant, for your good work. Uh, engineering, we had another engineering standing committee uh, 
a couple of weeks ago, a big part of that uh, was a discussion of installation of sidewalks, in particular, uh, the side, uh, the, the road reconstruction project that's going in on Kennedy uh, and Gregory roads. And uh, for those residents who live there, they'll be happy to hear that they'll have a nice uh, sidewalk, new curbing, drainage, um, and roadway. Uh, it's another example of how we were trying to add sidewalks wherever we can to increase, uh, increase walkability and safety in our town and the investment we make in our roadways uh, to make sure that our uh, infrastructure is up to snuff. Uh, my last report is regarding shared services. Uh, for the past year, I've have been reporting uh, multiple times uh, about updates relating to the shared services working group uh, that I first pulled together in 2019. Uh, this working group uh, now comprises Morris Township, Morris Town, Morris Plains, Madison, Chatham Township, and Chatham Borough. Um, and I had previously reported that this group of six towns had applied for a project grant from the New Jersey State uh, Department of Community Affairs. And tonight I am pleased to inform the community uh, that uh, we, we, had, we I had previously informed the community that we had received the grants. And tonight we awarded uh, the contract to the Canning Group uh, to go ahead and, uh, and do the study, uh, which will be underway shortly. Um, as the lead agency in the study, this is yet another area where Morris Township is taking a proactive approach to implementing best practices uh, and saving taxpayer dollars. So we hope that this will be uh, beneficial not only for our town, but for six towns. Um, and again, uh, be a guiding uh, best practice principle for other towns um, in the state of New Jersey. I'd like to again, thank uh, Mr. Quinn for all his hard work in bringing this home. Um, as a lead agency, Mr. Quinn has to do a little bit of extra work on uh, behalf of all the other towns. Let's make it happen. So thank you, Mr. Quinn. Not very good. That concludes my committee reports for tonight. So now we're going to go back and do uh, just general commentary, and then we'll go in the same order. Mr. Jerfy first. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I will echo the condolences already expressed to the Prendergast family. Um, I, one thing I will add, um, and was stated at the uh, memorial service this evening for the fire department, um, I believe uh, Bill Prendergast was also credited for uh, saving numerous lives at a large fire at Del Barton many years ago. Uh, and that's just another um, significant thing he did for others during his uh, life of service in the military and the police department and the fire company. Um, I also send my condolences to the Phillips family. Uh, Tom Phillips Sr. was a member of Fairchild Fire Company. Um, our thoughts are with them as well. Um, it's been a tough uh, week for the fire department um, with the loss of uh, two members from different fire companies. Um, and speaking of the fire department, I would like to express my thanks to all the good work for the firefighters who made quick work of the commercial structure fire on MLK this, uh, this afternoon, um, where a forklift caught fire inside the building. Um, we had a lot of uh, members come out and a lot of uh, mutual aid departments come to help fight that fire. Um, lastly, I just wanted to remind the public of the 20th anniversary of September 11th and Morris Township will be holding its memorial service before our September meeting. Uh, at our 9-11 Memorial at Ginty Field. Uh, that will take place at 6 p.m. on September 14th. That's all I have, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Committee Woman Wilson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I just, I wanted to um, underline and emphasize how happy I am that we've introduced the, uh, the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. And I wanted to thank Deputy Mayor Jorphy for his um, support on that and his, um, um, his assistance. So uh, we've, we've taken the step and I'm glad that we have and I think it'll be a good thing for our community. I wanted to uh, mention uh, there was an employee, Curtis Wrightout, who was recognized on our resolution for 40 years of service to Mars Township. Wanted to thank that person for their service. Uh, I have a few comments I wanted to make about pilots. Um, I recently wrote an op-ed on pilots, payment in lieu of taxes. This piece appeared in Monday's Morristown Green, and it will also appear in tomorrow's Newsweek. So if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to check it out. I wrote this article for a couple of purposes to help people understand how pilots work, to explain why it's important in my view for Morristown and Morris Township to work together on them and to advocate that we do just that. So I wanted to highlight a couple of points from that piece in my comments tonight. 
pilots are financial agreements that impact our property taxes in ways that are complicated and not well understood. Pilots substitute an annual service charge, a payment in lieu of taxes on certain redevelopment projects. An important feature of pilots is that they do not include any funding for the school tax levy. This funding gap does get paid. It's picked up as part of the regular taxes paid by everyone else. In our case, that includes taxpayers from both of our towns, not just the town that initiated the pilot. The key point about pilots that stands out to me, they connect us. A pilot in one of our towns creates tax implications in the other town. We need to be in touch with each other about pilots. One possibility I think is worthy of discussion is we could agree to a certain percent of our pilot revenues uh, putting them toward the school district. This would help to mitigate the impact to everyone else that's caused by the revenue gap pilots create for the school district levy. I was astonished to learn that Hanover Township already does this. Hanover has agreed to donate 19% of their pilot revenues to the regional school district they share with Forum Park and East Hanover. I think that is really impressive and kudos to them for doing that. We could do something similar here or we could come up with our own ideas. In the latest pilot project, which Morris Towns Council voted on last night, it was an 85 unit apartment building on Morris Street. They were particularly proud of including in this pilot 18 affordable housing units, 14 of which will be supervised housing for people with disabilities. They should be proud of that. It's a great public benefit. And kudos to them for including it. The important thing about pilots, I think, is that we should be talking with each other and listening to each other and working together on that. Another option I think is worthwhile is encouraging the state legislature to step in and require that a certain percent of pilot revenues go to the schools. A few years back, this is exactly what the state legislature did. They stepped in and required that 5% of pilot revenues go to the county. I'd like to see the state legislature explore similar requirements for schools. Going back to the local level, while we're at it, there's so many other topics besides just pilots that I think it would be great for our two towns, Morristown and Morris Township, to communicate about and work with, together on. Some examples, seniors issues, we're starting our new committee. I can only imagine there'll be many issues that uh, would be of interest to seniors in both of our towns, environmental issues, I know there's been talk over the years about many other issues, open space, a skate park, working to connect our bike and walking trails, to name just a few. And I know from my, my own experience, finding ways to support positive dialogue and collaboration across our two towns is a topic of great interest to many of our residents. Uh, I would hope, hopefully we'll find ways to do more of that in the future. So for now, in the short run, I think it's really important for us to get the lines of communication open and begin really working together on pilots. I hope to see more people agreeing on that point. And I encourage all of us to think about what we can do to make that happen in the future. So that is my comment on pilots. And I did also want to just say that I mean, uh, very happy to see what the transportation committee is doing with the bike group. I think that's a really great project. And um, thank you to all the everyone who's working on that. Thank you, Mayor. That's it. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rabbits. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, and, and thank you to the members of the public in attendance for participating in your local government. Government works best when the public is informed and engaged. Uh, congratulations to the Morris Town Area American Little League for winning the state championship. Well done. And congratulations to Nick Fink on his role in representing us and our country in the Tokyo Olympics. You are an inspiration. For my public commentary this evening, I'd like to touch on a couple of things. And I apologize in advance for 
being a little bit more long-winded than usual. Uh, first, uh, today's a good day to talk about personal responsibility. Actually, any day is a good day to talk about it. It's a concept very much entrenched in our discourse and our politics. It informs and guides many of our political discussions. It can be considered the cornerstone of different schools of thought. In the bigger picture, the idea is that more individuals, that the more individuals exercise personal responsibility, the freer we will be. If we as, as individuals all do what is right, there will be less need for government intervention and fewer laws mean more freedoms. It's actually wonderful in its simplicity. However, some questions need to be asked and answered. First, where are we now at this moment in time, at this point in our history with it? I think most of us here have heard or read about people who say, you can't make me wear a mask or you can't force me to get a vaccine. For those who talk about personal responsibility, that's only half the statement. What we should be hearing and reading is, you can't make me wear a mask because I'm already wearing one. Or you can't force me to be fully vaccinated because I already am. I'm already exercising personal responsibility is what we should all be hearing because I already understand that what comes out of my nose and mouth when I talk, cough or sneeze may put others at risk. That, that right there is a perfect example of understanding personal responsibility. Where are all the small government officials, talking heads and pundits advocating for personal responsibility? This is their golden opportunity to shine and lead by example for all of us to see. It's more important to them to state the same contrarian talking points as they've done, well, probably since the last 40 years. Some people who have been skeptical are now only beginning to realize the gravity of the situation in which they now find themselves and they're starting to want vaccines. That's good, but it's not personal responsibility because they're tired of hospitals being overwhelmed. They're tired of the senseless deaths and the suffering of the long-term effects of a virus. Many of us have read that there is anger toward the unvaccinated for prolonging the pandemic. However, we must understand there is no one reason these people have decided not to get vaccinated. The seeds of doubt and confusion have been coming from those who have a vested interest in not meeting vaccine goals. Yes, small government officials who talk about personal responsibility but didn't proclaim it when it was most needed are to blame, as well as the talking head and pundits who have told people that government, science, and experts cannot be trusted. In the first incredibly visible public test of this ideology, it failed spectacularly. It has not even encouraged the most basic form of personal responsibility that the rest of us know is necessary. Government and personal responsibility aren't mutually exclusive. Let's take a step back from politics and think about how lucky we are to call the USA home. Selfishness and dereliction of duty did, did not make America great. The Constitution aimed to promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. We need to think beyond our own selfish interests. Keep in mind that those who want small government and talk of freedom, i.e. freedom not to wear a mask, remember what they are essentially calling for is anarchy. But anarchy only works when there's 100% of people taking personal responsibility. That being said, I'm particularly proud of the residents of Mars Township and Mars County as a whole for their well above average vaccination rates. Please encourage your family and friends wherever they may reside to become fully vaccinated. Americans must again put country over themselves. From the war for independence to the fight against fascism in Europe, Americans have sacrificed. From women's rights to civil rights, we have fought and strived for that more perfect union. Americans have, have given the last full measure of their devotion time and time again when duty calls. It's calling once again. 
Second, I want to touch very briefly on the finding of the 2020 census showing fewer white people and a 276% increase in those who identify themselves as multiracial. I'm not surprised and none of us should be. We were told of this trend two generations ago. Watching, listening, and reading what comes from so-called media outlets, we learn that being a minority in the US isn't difficult, unless they've been lying to us all these years. They know of the injustices and the spread of misinformation. They knew of this, the injustices and the spread of misinformation in order to keep them. There are a lot of people who are afraid they may actually end up being in the minority population. And if so, that is an acknowledgement that there are, uh, there's, there are systemic issues in our country regarding some demographic groups that work to disadvantage them. And it's this system that might be turned against them. If that truly is at the very heart of the matter, perhaps it's best to start correcting those issues now. Disadvantaged people aren't looking for vengeance. They're looking for equal protections under the law. Equal protections for all of us does not infringe on the rights of any of us. Let's have some empathy for our fellow citizens and our fellow humans. Let's not kick down upon the people who have less political or economic power of some of us might now enjoy. Rather, let's face up to those who profit from our division. Thank you, and back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Havitz. Uh, Mr. Mancuso. Thank you very much, sir. Um, just a reiteration of uh, what went on in the beginning of the meeting. Um, our 11-year-olds have, by winning the state championship, allowed the uh, championship the next year for the 12-year-olds to come to Mars Township's Ginty Field. I think that's an absolutely wonderful thing. Uh, we were able to get the uh, flag uh, of the champions uh, flying through the great efforts of Tim Quinn, who had to go out and have the rivets put in the flag to get it up. But uh, it was a proud moment for all the boys and the coaches who saw it. Um, sorry about uh, uh, two good friends, Bill Prendergast and Sam Champy. Sam was a personal friend of mine. We coached Little League uh, on opposite sides of, of the town for many, many years. I went to his wake and there were at least 200 people there. And they said it was much more crowded before I got there. So I was just happy to have been part of his situation. Uh, my best wishes to Kurt right out for his 40 years of service. And uh, I noticed that uh, more and more people or blocks or neighborhoods are having block parties. And boy, I think that's a great thing for Morris Township. Since we had to sit here for 16 months without having any ability to do stuff like this, I'm very glad to see it happening. And my final point is uh, every year about this time, except for last year because of COVID, my son, Ken Mancuso, uh, comes in from his monastery in uh, Belmont Abbey. He's a Benedictine monk. Uh, he's been sitting with us the last couple of hours. He's enjoyed everything he's seen and heard. And just thank you, Ken, for being part of my family. That's all I have, sir. Thank you, Peter, for sharing that last remark. Very, uh, very touching and glad Ken could be with us tonight as well. Um, for my uh, remarks, I too would like to congratulate uh, Curtis Rideout for the 40 years of service to the municipality. Uh, thank you for your hard work that benefits um, all of our residents. I also wanted to thank the Legislative Standing Committee for their work in creating uh, the Senior Citizen Advisory Committee. And I would like to point out that this is just another example of how this Morris Township Committee seeks community involvement in how we run our town. We are constantly trying to do better, uh, getting more input in various different ways. And this is another way that we will be doing that in the future. Uh, Again, take note because of the Jewish holidays in September that we've moved our monthly committee meeting to Tuesday, September 14th. That is on a Tuesday again, not a Wednesday. Uh, the meeting starts at the usual 7 p.m. time. And as Mr. Jeffrey mentioned, uh, we're having our 9-11 tribute ceremony at six o'clock right before the meeting. Across the street by the gazebo is a 9-11 monument. Um, and that's where we will be gathering. 
Uh, I also want to mention that Morris County will be holding their memorial service on Sunday, September 12th uh, at the County 911 Memorial on West Hanover Avenue. I believe that starts at six, six o'clock. All right, very good. And I too would like to close my remarks by again, uh, thanking Sam Champy and Bill Pendergrass uh, for all they've done uh, for the community. Uh, we are sorry to see them pass, uh, but they are examples of how people can give back and make uh, their communities better places for everybody. I encourage everybody to get involved in some form or fashion uh, in making our community uh, better for other people, um, giving back, um, volunteering in some form or fashion with some organization. Um, if you would like to volunteer and would like some suggestions about where your efforts might be best placed, uh, please contact me and we'd be happy to help find you an appropriate uh, role uh, in, in some organization, even if it's not with Morris Township. So again, uh, thank you for your service, uh, Mr. Pendergrass, Mr. Champy. Uh, to our township, and I will close my remarks with that for this evening. Uh, next on the agenda is a second round of public comments and inquiry. So we will open it up to the public, and if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm sorry, but the meeting's wrong way. It should be there in about 20 minutes. Is that okay? I don't see anybody. Nope. Uh, well, up to it. No. Nope. Okay, very good. Uh, seeing none, I'll uh, ask somebody close the public portion. So moved. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Very good. Uh, next is consideration of a monthly report uh, that uh, can be found if you want a copy of them uh, in the clerk's office or the township administrator's office. Uh, will somebody move consideration of monthly reports? So moved. Second. Very good. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, uh, we also have uh, claims for payment, a list of bills and vouchers totaling $9,566,627.59. And I remind everybody that we are the tax collector uh, for the school district and the county and the library, and then we dole out those funds. So that's why that number is so high. That's not all Morris Township. Uh, will somebody move claims, claims for payment? So move, Mr. Mayor. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, 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 Madam Clerk, can we have a roll call on that? Mr. Jurphy? Yes. Mr. Rabbits? Yes. Mr. Mancuso? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Mayor Grazel? Uh, yes. And last, we have a consent calendar. There are five, five items on the consent calendar. Uh, will somebody move that? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Um, with, with that, we will adjourn the meeting uh, to again to reconvene on Tuesday, September 14th, 2021. Uh, 7 p.m. is our regular meeting, and we will have a 5 p.m. closed session, followed by the 6 p.m. ceremony uh, at the 9-11 Memorial. Thank you uh, to all the residents for attending tonight. appreciate you sticking around until 9 o'clock, and we'll see you next month. Motion to adjourn, Thanks, sir. Good night. Ah, yes, motion to adjourn. Thank you.